Well, let me start with a couple of things. Who am I? I'm a very humble urban planner. How did I become an urban planner? There are a couple people here in the audience whom I think I had a privilege of teaching. They just came to me and said that at some point I taught them. That's always a pride for people who do this. That's why we get connected to this education. I am an urban planner probably because I did not have the, we, the urban planners also have some ideas about the cities and buildings. And usually they end up in urban planning if they do not have the real personality to become architects. I did try in the beginning to be an architect, but somehow that was not probably not the personality that I had. So I ended up in urban planning. I teach a little bit at the university, and I also practice the faith of the uh, urban planning practice. The presentation that I'm going to make right now is to give you an overview. Dr. Pramod Akal, who is the, the real inspiration for all this project, in the beginning, right in the book, right in the beginning of this program, he indicated to you how this particular project came about. He's got his stamina of the Manhattan Racer. And I told him this morning that I can last with you only for two days. Then I'm going to go and race for a week. And he kind of continues on. So that's how he is. And we all kind of uh, support him, Dronji, myself, and him, and then we have a couple other colleagues within NRNA that has made all this idea kind of possible. And I'm gonna give you a, a brief description of where we are so that you have an idea. It's still an initiative, it's still a beginning, there's a long way to go. I also want to give you an idea of what are the next steps that we're thinking about so that you can contemplate, you can begin to contemplate in your own mind that there might be some contribution that you can make. From what he always tells me that everyone can contribute. People who give are happier, right? So that's something that uh, is uh, supposed to be the initiation. So there was a real introduction by Pramozzi in terms of this initiation, the course content, and the total idea of the academic delivery from Dronozzi. I will come into a little more of a business aspect of it, and then we'll have a few other uh, speeches from our main partners uh, and uh, the keynote speech and maybe some kind of uh, a framing of the discussion from uh, Honorable Ambassador and then we'll go for a discussion. So I've uh, prepared a couple of slides. Let me go through some of them. The objective that I have, I forgot to bring I think my pointer. Uh, basically, I want to give you some highlight of the structure and I also want to identify some of the funding opportunities, and then I'll kind of give you a little bit of a briefing of some of the discussions that we are having with potential funders. And the fundraising strategies, potential partners, we already have one or two solid partners. The most important partners in this initiative is Athabasca. They've been very generous, very kind, and, and, and very uh, uh, strong supporters. And then I want to give a little bit of formulation of the next step in terms of strategies. Okay. So, sometimes you debate a lot. You talk about making committees, and then you want to make a plan. But at the end, after all that discussion, you spin the wheel and say, okay, here is our luck. So that's not exactly the way that we want to do, because sometimes in bureaucracy, even when you spend a lot of time, it's the luck of the draw at the end. And as planners, as educational planners, engineers, and lots of PhDs in the room, and lots of people with experience, we do want to go with a little bit of planning on this one. Okay. So most of you know about this initiative because we've been talking about it. But there are some people who are not exactly totally oriented to this particular initiative. To those people, this is and external collaborative partners which are trying to support an initiative of the government, government of Nepal itself. The Open University of Nepal has been something that the government has thought about it for quite a few years. And the non-resident Nepalese association is the larger diaspora association is an organization that is trying to support it. A little bit about NRNA, it's a global organization with the National Coordination Council in about 60 countries, 57 right now, it's approaching 60 countries. Almost 10% of the Nepalese population of about 28, 30 million people are abroad. They are a part of the diaspora. 
some of us are a little more privileged in North America, Europe, and Australia, and some people are kind of thriving the streets in the Middle East and Malaysia and so on. But all of them combined make that diaspora, <coughs> and we have an association which is pretty well recognized and well supported in the club. And that is that has many task forces. Through one of the task forces, we have uh, initiated to support this program. So the Open University of Nepal initiative to support the government of Nepal is one of the major projects of NRI. That's what gives it that weight and the credibility of the diaspora. The other initiator is the Canada Foundation for Nepal, that is headed by Dr. Taka, and many of you are advisors, and you know about the CFFN, which is headquartered right here in Ottawa. Then, of course, those are the proponents we began, but the team has kind of expanded. There are many other people who are partners. Then we have formed the Open University of Nepal Strategy Committee. Consists of about 15 people, ambassador to Canada, ambassador to US, ambassador to New York, and ambassador to Australia from Nepal. They are members. United Nations. United Nations, New York. And the, uh, ambass uh, the uh, secretary of the Ministry of Education is also a member. Three of us are members. Dr. Rajwa Dikari from Australia are members. And we are also thinking of uh, making some advisors. Uh, a couple of names that are already kind of formed up is Dr. Panago, the president of uh, Athabasca University, who is uh, one of the bulwarks of our supporters. So that has been formulated. Then the uh, government of Nepal, education ministry is our main contacts. We are also in the process of working with some Nepalese partners and identifying them. There are international partners, Athabasca being number one. We also had commitment from the University of Houston system. We had the first workshop in Houston a couple months ago. They have given us the word on that declaration. And then, of course, the North America and the larger diaspora is the total stakeholder and partner in this one. OK, so if you want to uh, conceptualize where is this open university thing coming in, a lot of details still need to be worked. But you can see there is CFFN and is doing the content development type of things. There is a government of Nepal which will, which will uh, endow the legal authority and endorsement for this particular project. There are institutions and distance education sites which are going to be the, the, uh, the main substance of it. Then there is an RNA external collaboration, fundraising, and so on. Some of those activities that NRNA, the larger diaspora, will do. And that constitutes, at the core, is the Open University of Nepal. So diagrammatically, if you want to think where we are coming from, this is one of the clarity through the picture. So the institutional arrangement coming from that particular diagram that we just saw, the institutional arrangement still needs to be worked, but we have to start at some place. It's going to be something like the NRNA would be partner or even a part owner. That's something that we need to work out. The government of Nepal could be an owner or a stakeholder. That is, again, we are in the process of the memorandum of understanding. Canada Foundation for Nepal, a registered charity organization right here in Canada, is going to be a very important partner to this endeavor. Many of the fundraising and many of the legalities we can do through CFF. And of course, international financing institutes and domestic partners. Anything from CEDA, IDRC, World Bank, ADB, all those organizations will come into make, making this particular project possible. How is this arranged? How is that particular institutional arrangement done? There is an RNA, that's the larger diaspora of two and a half million people, that's the association which is situated, the headquarter in Nepal. There are task forces, there are 14 task forces within an RNA. It's, uh, I was talking to someone in, with CEDA yesterday. Nine is large. It has a huge bureaucracy. It has 100 International Coordination Council members. It has office bearers like ourselves. I'm the Regional Coordinator for America. Dr. Dasari, uh, Rasari is uh, the uh, Deputy Regional Coordinator for the Americas. Dr. Dhaka is the representative from Canada. It's a very large organization. And uh, I was uh, basically telling the uh, uh, officer from CEDA, it's almost like a World Bank. It's global, mm -hmm. but without money. <laughs> uh, but lots of ideas. And then within that task force, we have a sub-task force that looks after the education. Uh, this was the initial problem about, about the task force. Yeah. Uh, say that again. 
what is the uh, task force? Oh, a little bit. The, the task force is the skill, knowledge, innovation exchange. It's a kind of high, high sounding mouthful of a name. Uh, it's uh, led by Dr. Rajwa Dikari in uh, Australia. It has members. It's one of those 15 task forces that NRNA has. It has task forces on dual citizenship. It has task forces on promotion of Nepal abroad, promoting tourism. It has task forces on women's issues, on youth issues. It has task forces on uh, the uh, science and technology that you saw right here. So among them is one, that is the ski, that's easier to say, skill knowledge, information exchange. And then we have a distance education. It is the initial core proponent team, but it has expanded. It has expanded horizontally. It has also expanded vertically. There are many, many people who are part of the team now. All right, so what kind of structure are we envisioning? I was mentioning before that the government of Nepal Education Ministry, it had already thought about OEU. It is something that kind of masked our own ideas of giving something back to Nepal. They have made some studies on why open university is going to be important. They've got some ideas about the targeted students. And they have uh, some initial estimates, something that we need to discuss with them a little more. But as you know, the Nepalese style of working sometimes, and many of us in the room are Nepalese, it is somewhat, uh, sometimes not always very scientific. We've got to go a little more detail on that. There's also a bill that's being floated in the parliament to enable a universities like the Open Universities of Nepal. And we have an opportunity to kind of modify that particular bill to suit some of the needs that we have. So it doesn't become one of the bureaucratic universities where the appointment is done by the government and put the vice chancellor who could be former military general or something like that in Pakistan. We want to make it a little more open, open structure where it is going to attract uh, a more uh, different talents and so on. So that's something that we need to work on. But the status right now is the, uh, the bill is under consideration. We are still working on all of these things. Dr. Rosani gave you some ideas graphically about the map of Nepal, where it could be basically located. As you know, the open university is going to be essentially a virtual wall. It doesn't really have to be in a particular ground. As a matter of fact, when I was discussing with Dr. Ali last night, if you want to start a program, he indicated to me that if we have some really good content, we don't even need to have a, a mainframe computer in Nepal. They can upload it for us right here in Athabasca, near Edmonton. And the internet system in Nepal will be picking that up. So there are many, many of those kind of possibilities, like the internet in Nepal or India, people watch, very often might be uploaded in Shia, for that matter, the main thing. So those are some of the ideas. But still, we want to have a place. We want to give it a name. There will be some head office. And there will be some anchorage ideas for people to build there. There are some thoughts. These are very initial, but I just wanted to give it some reality to the idea. It could be on that zone that he talked about. It could be close to the workplace of Buddha that we located. We might start with about 2,000 students. And then over 10 years, it can grow up. And it can also, because we intend to do it in English language, it can be international. It can capture the market in the vicinity, just like the Indira Gandhi Open University of Nepal is capturing some of the market in Nepal. The Nepal Open University can capture some of the other areas, especially when we raise the standard. There are many places, things in Nepal, like the Himal paper, Himal magazine, that is the, the kind of highlight of the South Asian uh, uh, journalism. It's headquartered in Nepal, but it's, it's such a high standard that people contribute from all of, all of those areas. So those are some of the possibilities. 